This is Curative Design, and I'm Ruin Matthews. One of my favorite stories to share with med students and residents has to do with a man named Ignaz Semmelweis. I love this story because I get so much out of it every time I visit it. I've used it to talk about innovation, public health, quality improvement projects, culture change, the patient experience, the list goes on. In fact, given just how much there is to unpack from this story, I've decided to share it by way of two episodes. I should also add that I'm especially grateful to the work of Dr. Andrew Cunningham and his formidable Making of Modern Medicine series on BBC for inspiring much of the conceptual framework for these essays. If you haven't heard it, download it on Audible and prepare to be enthralled by stories of medical discovery. Let's get started. Vienna during the 1800s was an exciting place to be. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart had tragically died just a few years before the turn of the century, but laid the musical foundation for the works of Beethoven, Haydn, and Strauss, who were prolific during this period. Goethe was contemplating the basics of his opus, Faust, and right around this time, a boy by the name of Sigmund Freud was born. Speaking of babies being born, the city's leadership in a progressive coup commissioned the building of two specialty clinics dedicated to maternal and child health. In a time where the very notion of hospitals seemed innovative, Vienna was dabbling in the idea of subspecialty clinics, respectively named the first and second obstetrical clinics. They were progressive because of two reasons. Firstly, they sought to address the worsening public health issue of infanticide of illegitimate children by way of offering access to high-quality obstetrical and midwifery care to populations who had traditionally been unable to afford it specifically the destitute, homeless, and sex workers. Secondly, they delivered this model for free in exchange for being an institution where student doctors and midwives could train. The only other hospital of its kind was the Rotunda Hospital in Dublin, where I had the privilege of doing my OBGYN rotations as a medical student while at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. Indeed, if you were an obstetrician in the 1800s, the place to be was the Vienna Obstetrical Clinics. A teaching facility, it simultaneously supported teams of medical students, midwives, and teaching attendings. Ignaz Semmelweis was one of these physicians, although in truth, much of the story takes place while he was an assistant to his professor, the U.S. equivalent of being a chief resident. Brilliant, passionate, and at times harsh, he was nonetheless one of the favorites of the students, owing to his tremendous fund of knowledge, largely self-taught, and his tireless work ethic. So with seemingly unlimited resources, teams of physicians, a dedicated facility, what could possibly go wrong? Well, it turns out a great deal. Now, before we continue, it's important to provide some context. The 1800s was a different world in terms of our notions of medicine and healthcare. As mentioned earlier, even the very idea of cohorting patients in buildings called hospitals was still fairly new. And while education was held in high regard, evidenced by the concept of teaching rounds where the students learned both by observation and the actual work of patient care, medical science itself was still in its infancy. In fact, autopsy, or post-mortem analysis, was frequently employed as a means of finding out what had happened with the patient after death and often done right after the completion of rounds, and sometimes in the middle of rounds. And yet, despite this, there was a genuine will to learn and apply the Hippocratian methods of observational learning and experiential knowledge to the medical sciences. And few others were as committed to this as Samuel himself. So what was the problem? Well. In a nutshell, women, young, healthy women, were coming into the hospital to have their babies and dying. And the story, for the most part, was very similar. Shortly after delivering the baby, the woman would be beset with fevers, shaking chills and general malaise. The lucky few would begin to recover, but then a large number would go on to slip into a coma and then die. He knew the numbers were bad, but no idea just how bad. And this was probably his first breakthrough. The simple act of deciding to collect patient mortality data itself at the time for the purpose of further defining the problem was somewhat novel. He gathered the mortality data from the first clinic, which was staffed by physicians and medical students, and the second clinic, which was staffed by midwives alone. What he discovered shocked and confounded him. The mortality rate of the second midwife-run clinic was substantially better than that of the physician-led clinic. In some instances, the mortality of the physician-led clinic would soar up to 30%, effectively one in three patients dying under their care. But the breakthrough moment came when his good friend and colleague Jakob Koleczka 
accidentally pricked his finger with a scalpel while conducting an autopsy on one of the bodies of the recently deceased young mothers. Kolechka developed symptoms that mimicked the symptoms of childbed fever almost exactly, and despite the personal tragedy of losing a close friend, it would not be in vain. Day and night, I was haunted by the image of Kolechka's disease and was forced to recognize ever more decisively that the disease from which Kolechka died was identical to that from which so many maternity patients had died. He concluded that some sort of unseen infectious agent was being transmitted from the bodies of the dead mothers to the bodies of the living mothers, and that the vector was none other than himself and his students, and possibly through the act of contact. In a sort of Faustian twist, the great realization was that in their diligence to find out what was killing their young female patients, they may have been inadvertently infecting more women. They quite literally had blood on their hands. Tune in for part two of this story to see how Semmelweis took this realization and sought to fix it with astounding results, only to be followed by tragedy of another kind. This is Curative Design, and I'm Erin Matthews. Thanks for listening.